Yeah, thanks everyone for attending. Um, my name is Rafael. I um, I'm a software developer at IBM. I, I joined IBM about a couple of years ago where I was a developer on a consulting team and maybe a couple of months ago or so I joined an open tech team. Uh, maybe you're here for, for Tommy and Yihong's presentations before me, but I work with them. Um, and, and my focus is, is the project's uh, K-Serve and Model Mesh, which you probably also heard Tommy speak a bit to. Um, so the title of my talk is a bit specific, but there's a few different things that I want to, I want to touch on. Uh, so I'll start by talking about model serving in general uh, and some of the, the, the considerations that somebody has to, has to think about when it comes to implementing something like a, a model serving platform. Uh, then I'll introduce the, the project's case serve and model mesh and I'll go into a bit more detail about um, some of their features and, and more specifically model mesh and the use case that it, uh, it takes care of. Uh, then I'll talk about monitoring, uh, more on the ops side and, and uh, monitoring things like, like a model mesh deployment and some of their resources. And then I'll get into custom runtime creation where you might bring in your own custom model with some, some certain features, um, deploy it on model mesh, and then uh, that'll be more of like a, a demo towards the end. So model serving in general is, uh, is a very important part of the MLOps pipeline. Um, obviously, it's not enough to just train a bunch of models and, and hope people use them. You have to um, make some type of interface with them and, and make them uh, consumable by, by end users or applications that want to incorporate the AI that you've, you've trained into their services. And usually what this looks like is um, um, creating some type of API that, that clients and, and applications can make requests to to get what they need. So that strategy is um, more commonly described as, as like deploying model as a microservice. Um, and so again, this is building an interface to a model uh, and exposing it to clients as an API endpoint, whether it's REST or, or otherwise. And this strategy works because uh, many developers are, are used to doing this strategy already for existing software stacks. But when it comes to applying this to models in general, uh, there's a few considerations and maybe difficulties to overcome. For example, uh, how do we containerize a model like an application? Um, are inference response times acceptable, right? Are, are users and, and, and applications getting what they need quick enough? Uh, and then, of course, there's the complexity that comes with all of the different frameworks that are out there in model formats, like TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, Triton's, uh, um, uh, and NVIDIA's Triton, or, or Seldon's ML server, and so on. So that's where a project like KServe comes in, uh, because KServe essentially takes care of all of these things for you, and KServe is this this model inference platform built entirely on Kubernetes. Um, and so what KServe does best is, is it takes a bunch of projects and kind of puts it all into kind of a one-stop shop for you. Um, but one thing to emphasize with KServe is that it uses the standardized inference protocol across so many different ML frameworks. So like I mentioned before, there's so many frameworks and how do you, how do you um, interact with all of them? Uh, there's this big um, drive to, to find a standard in all of these communities and they work together to do that. Uh, KServe also has serverless um, inference workload with auto scaling um, and, and features like that. And then uh, something that even just before me, Tommy mentioned, uh, KServe upon deploying models comes with a bunch of pluggable metrics and features, um, especially around explainability, things like drift detection and bias detection um, and things like that. Now, while KServe handles the vast majority of um, model serving use cases, uh, it works upon, for the most part, upon this pod per model diagram, which essentially means that you, know, you deploy a model, there's a pod deployed with that. You deploy another model, that means another pod. And there's this trend among organizations to deploy larger and larger numbers of models. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons. One might be better accuracy, so you can imagine uh, language models trained for chatbots. Um, a a chatbot for a post office might be very different than a chatbot for, for a bank because of different contexts, different vocabularies used. And, and that's just one example of why it might be more accurate to have separate language models for each. And then on top of that, you might think about you know, different actual languages as well and translating those things. Um, and then another reason is also on the data privacy side where Training models separately, you get to, to separate or isolate user data 
um, or different types of data between models. So when we start to think about uh, this pod per model diagram and you start to think about maybe use cases where you get into not just thousands of models, but maybe tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of models, you can start to maybe see how, how you can hit um, these hard limitations that comes um, with these things, like, like for example, compute resource limitations or maximum pod limitations and, and maximum IP address limitations because you're assigning each of those models or pods uh, IPs as well. And so that's where a, a, a project like Model Mesh comes in. And so Model Mesh is used for this specific use case where you're running tens of thousands of models and that's because um, what it does most special is it, is it breaks the pod per model uh, paradigm and um, it, it deploys multiple models across you know, single pods. Um, and so Model Mesh has actually been used in production by IBM for, for several years and it's been, I guess, and it continues to be the backbone for many Watson Cloud services uh, like Watson Assistant and Watson NLU and Watson Discovery, among others. Um, and it was recently open sourced by IBM, I believe, within the past couple of years. And again, it's designed for these high scale, high density, um, you know, again, think about tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe small to medium models that are used in a very random fashion. Um, and it's, it's made for these use cases. And, and the special thing that Model Mesh does is it intelligently loads and unloads models to and from memory uh, in an attempt to optimize between responsiveness. So a user, you know, needs access to a model now, um, as well as their computational footprint. So maybe you can think of a model that isn't used so much, but how do you minimize its impact to, to computation or compute? So at a high level, here are some of the features that Model Mesh brings with it. And, and this might give you an idea of a, a bit of, about how Model Mesh actually works. Uh, the first is cache management. So Model Mesh, uh, the controller essentially looks at all of models like an LRU cache, uh, LRU meaning least recently used. So the way that it loads and unloads copies of models are based on, on two factors. One is, one is usage recency, so you know, how recently a model has been, has been inferenced on or um, attempted to be accessed, uh, and current request volume, so how heavily used or how popular a model is. From there, we get into intelligent placement and loading. Uh, and placement refers to the idea that uh, a model doesn't just have to be on one pod. Uh, if, if a model, depending on its cache age as well as its request load, so if it's heavily used, it can actually be scaled across multiple pods and therefore more, more accessible. Uh, and then when it comes to loading, uh, concurrent model loads are always constrained or queued in order to minimize impact uh, to runtime traffic. And then, of course, there are the two bigger features like resiliency, which is simply referring to automatic recovery. So failed model loads are, are automatically retried in different pods. And then operational simplicity, which is all about rolling updates, which is handled automatically and, and safely. So um, there's this concept of a, a V model in model mesh where an endpoint to a model is um, only updated. So say you have some endpoint that's already pointing to a model and you want a new version of that model. Um, that endpoint will only be pointed to the new version once that model is successfully deployed. So you know, this, this obviously avoids situations where you're pointing to a model that's not yet successfully loaded and, and failing or something like that. So, uh, this is sort of at a glance, like Model Mesh's uh, architecture. Um, I guess I'll point your attention maybe to just the left here, uh, where we have Runtime X deployment, and, and a deployment is, is basically the set of pods, and within the pods there are these three containers, uh, and those three containers are important. The, the first is the model server, uh, and of course this could be NVIDIA's Triton, this could be Torch Serve, it depends, this is what actually hosts the models. Then we have the puller container, and the puller is actually um, retrieving models from S3 or, or from some storage, and it's retrieving it in the way that the model server, whatever it may be, is expecting the model to be um, in, right, in its format. And then there's the mesh container, and the mesh container works across pods, and essentially that's where all the logic for model networking, placement, caching, and so on is. Um, and something else special that Model Mesh does is it actually brings its own etcd instance. And in here is where um, uh, there are, are, there's metadata about the models. So, for example, um, their sizes, how long they've been around, and things like that. 
So that gives you a bit of a background about model mesh and some of its features and maybe how, a bit about how it works. Uh, so now I'd like to get into monitoring. And, and maybe this is a little obvious, but there's, there's good reasons for monitoring something like a model serving framework or a platform, um, especially in a high density model serving environment uh, to, to be looking at resources and usage um, and looking at metrics like cluster utilization or, or the sizes of models and, and if they're being loaded among other things like inference request rates and all of these things. Um, by, by, by tracking these, these metrics, one can obviously react and make changes to resources or, or make other actions as needed. For example, one might increase cluster capacity if it's, if it's um, nearing that capacity or have to um, debug models that are, that are failing to load, if you can see that. So Model Mesh actually makes it fairly easy to uh, monitor all of the pods metrics, and this is because the pods actually expose metrics via an HTTP endpoint. Uh, and so at a high level, these are the three steps that, um, that, that one would go through to, to set up a, a dashboard or, or have access to the, the various metrics for Model Mesh. And the first is to set up the Prometheus operator. Um, Prometheus is essentially a monitoring system, and the operator is, is a Kubernetes native managed version of that. Uh, and this will monitor the, the namespace in which Model Mesh is deployed. From there, you simply create a service monitor, which is a, a custom resource definition um, provided by Prometheus, uh, which will discover all of the relevant pods and then scrape all of the metrics that are exposed by those pods. And then you simply access Grafana, which is a sort of like a dashboard visualizer system, and import the JSON template dashboard that that's provided in one of the repositories, and I re reference a few things that that are linked to at the very end of uh, at the very end of my presentation. But here's an example of what that that Grafana dashboard might look like, and this is just the first half. And I think it's yeah, it's, you can see it. So there's a lot of data here, and and you know I won't go through all of it, but essentially this is actually a subcomponent of of something at IBM that's in in production. Um, and, and firstly, you know, you can see something like cluster capacity and utilization right, right, um, right from the start. On the left, we can see model counts. And something interesting about model counts is that in green, we could see that there are 60,000 managed models. I think you could probably make that out. Um, and these models are managed. But in yellow, we can see that there are maybe about 5,000 loaded models. And, and there's a difference there because while there are 60,000 accessible models, um, the loaded models are the ones that are actually in cache or in memory uh, ready, to be, ready to be accessed or inferenced upon. On the right, this is um, you know, a bit messy here, but model counts per pod at the very least shows you um, all of these different colors or different pods, and, and it just shows you how dynamically over time uh, the number of models on a pod is, is changing pretty dynamically or pretty, pretty quickly as well. So this is just some of the, what's going on behind the scenes and what Model Mesh is doing. And then, of course, we have uh, on the bottom half of this, we have, we have um, metrics about API request rates and um, their, their, their sizes as well as response sizes and so on. On the second half of this dashboard, we have some more API stuff, and then we have some, some cache miss rates. And cache miss rates are essentially when a, a model might be inferenced upon but isn't yet loaded. Um, and that's just, that's just the stat for, for those who are monitoring this. And then at the bottom left, we can see the model loads and unloads per five minutes. And, and it's fairly symmetrical, um, but you can see you know, many, many loading and, and evictions uh, from pods uh, over time here. So well, you can see loaded model sizes and loaded, um, sorry, model loading times as well. Uh, and Grafana, if, if any of you have experience with it, it's, it's incredibly um, uh, versatile and, and, and kind of customizable. So it's not like this is exactly how your dashboard needs to look, nor is, it all, is this only all of the metrics that you can see, but there's, um, or the only ways that you can visualize it. You know, there's a lot of customizability there. So that is um, monitoring on Model Mesh. And now we'll get into uh, serving runtimes. And so a uh, serving runtime is essentially a, a template for a pod that can serve one or more model formats. Uh, and so this is, this is basically like um, if we think back to the architecture, this is what um, we would have our pods, we would have our, our model server, 
our polar and our mesh um, containers all within this. And this is basically what does the hosting and the, the inferencing of a, of a model. And so out of the box, we have integration with the following model servers. We have Triton's in inference server, um, Selden's ML server, OpenVINO, and, and, and TorchServe. But there are situations where uh, the out-of-the-box integrations might not be enough. Of course, you know, we're, we're working on, on bringing more in, but there are a few reasons for why you might want to create your own custom runtime, and, and Model Mesh, of course, makes it easy to do that. Uh, and the first is, of course, if the framework is not yet supported. Uh, maybe you also need extra custom functionality needed, and the out-of-the-box integrations, uh, you know, you have your own custom model that does a bit more than, than what the out-of-the-box frameworks do. Uh, and then, of course, maybe you have custom logic for, for inferencing. So the CRDs, or the custom resource definitions of serving runtimes in Model Mesh, allow for extensibility, and you never have to actually make modifications to any controller code. And, and this is something that I'll, I'll, I'll go into more detail and, and show you exactly how to do that. Um, and then on top of that, if the desired custom runtime is using an, a, a framework that is uh, using Python bindings or, or Python based, uh, it's even easier to, to, um, to create your own custom serving runtime because you can use ML server to provide the interface, you bring your own model code, and then you use model mesh sort of as the glue that, that binds them together and, and, and deploys your model. So here's a, a high level, you know, step by step on how to build your own uh, Python based custom serving runtime. So the first of course would be to prepare your model and interface it with, with ML server and I'll show an example of this. Uh, the second thing you have to do, you have to package your model class uh, or the model itself and, and its dependencies into a container image, uh, similar to an application, but this is essentially that, 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 that server that's going to be hosting your, your, your model. Um, and then lastly, you create that new serving runtime resource, uh, which is also going to be pointing to that custom container image and, and maybe include any environment variables that you need. And so, uh, so first of all, is anybody here watching like the World Cup or following the World Cup? I don't know. Japan has been, I mean, you know, I think last night was a sad day, if you know. But um, I made this demo, I guess, a, a week or two ago with, uh, with the assumption that Japan would, would not yet be out. But anyways, bear with me. Um, so, so here I have like a, a model, and this is just, a, this is just an example model. But um, we can, my, my trivial model that I made is, is simply a, a inputting a JSON. It's parsing the JSON and, and, and spitting back out you know, what's included in it, and then uh, including some server response. And you'll see that at the end. But, but here we have an example of what, um, what the ML server uh, interface would look like. And so this is implementing ML server's model class. Uh, we could see two main functions, of course. Um, it's uh, a load function, which is actually grabbing the model from somewhere, and then the predict function, which is you know going through the inputs, doing some work, and then and then making its outputs. Um, and again, my model is trivial; it, it simply input, uh, reads a JSON and, and and spits it out. But we're going to pretend that this model is is predicting the winner of the World Cup, and that's why I call it a soccer results model. And so this is the custom serving runtime definition now. Um, and, and here there's a few important things to point out. First of all, of course, it's a serving runtime, and then this is what I name it. I name it a soccer runtime. And so I'm pretending, essentially, that, that, that this runtime can only run models that are, are maybe soccer-related or something like that. And then we have a supported model format, which is basically telling Model Mesh which, which are the formats that, that, um, of models that can be deployed using the serving runtime. And I've made my own here, which I named soccer models. Again, I only want models deployed here that are soccer related. Um, but this could be just as easily maybe like, um, you know, uh, PyTorch's MAR um, or sklearn, you know, different types of model formats that are expected. And then down here we have a pointer to uh, or a spec for um, my custom image. And this is the image that I, I created prior, which takes my model and takes all of the dependencies and, and containerizes it. And then, of course, we would include our environment variables if necessary, uh, depending on the runtime that we're, or framework that we're bringing in. And so that is 
like how simple I guess it is to create a custom serving runtime. This is all you really need, but we can obviously go further and actually attempt to deploy a model on it. And, uh, and at a high level, these are the steps that you would take. Um, so first of all, when deploying any model with any serving runtime on Model Mesh, the model has to reside on some shared storage. I mentioned before in the architecture that the puller, puller um, goes to storage and you end up pointing to where in storage it needs to pull or retrieve the model from. Uh, and secondly, we need to create an inference service to serve the model. And an inter inference service is the main interface in both in KServe and Model Mesh um, for managing models. And, and, and we can kind of, it's interchangeable, I guess, with the model itself. But an inference service actually represents the, the logical endpoint for serving inferences. Uh, and then thirdly, you know, once you've created that inference service, you can you can check the status of it uh, and and. I guess one extra thing here is that even if you've created your serving runtime and there are no models yet deployed on it, pods won't actually be spun up until there's a need for them. So, so you have your serving runtime, you, you, you deploy your inference service, and only then will pods actually be uh, spun up with uh, a deployment of your model. So this is, um, this is an example of that inference service. And so here I've named this inference service the soccer results predictor, because this is sort of my model. Uh, and then in this inference service, you explicitly write um, which, which format it's in. And this is actually what Model Mesh uses to find uh, which runtime to deploy this model using, or this inference service using. So here I write soccer model. And, and as we know before, my custom serving runtime supports custom, uh, sorry, supports soccer models. Then we have a spec for runtime. And here I explicitly tell Model Mesh that uh, I want this, this inference service to be deployed using the runtime soccer runtime. But it's optional because Model Mesh will actually go through the runtimes and find um, which runtime actually supports the model format that you've, you've uh, explicitly written here. And then lastly, we have our, our, our pointer to the model itself. And, and in this case, I'm using a local min.io instance, and that's just because when you deploy Model Mesh, if you ever go through their documentation, uh, if you use the quick start um, version of the deployment, it'll actually come with a, a local min.io uh, storage and on it with a ton of example models. And so I went into that storage and I threw my model on there as well. So at this point, I can actually go to my terminal and I'll show you what this looks like in, uh, in practice. So first of all, uh, so first of all, this is just a local environment and, 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 and again, like a local deployment of Model Mesh. And, and here we just have, we can see that we have the, the basic pods that come with it, first of all, and that's the etcd um, instance, the min.io instance, and then the mesh controller. Uh, once we deploy our models, we would actually be able to see more pods, of course, but in, in this case, now we have no pods or no models deployed. So I have a... Uh, custom soccer runtime spec here, and this is very similar to what I showed before, uh, if not the exact same, but again, this is my, my custom serving runtime, and, and here I've named it my soccer runtime. I, I tell it I only want, uh, the only model formats that it supports are these soccer models, and then here are some environment variables just because that's the way ML server um, that you have to pass um, for ML server to work with model mesh, and, and there's more information about this in the in the documentation itself, and of course, I'm pointing to the the image that I've um, where I've containerized my model, and so we will uh, create this resource. And now, when I get my serving runtimes on this instance, we'll actually see that first of all there was already a torch serve runtime ready to go, and we can actually see that the model types that it supports is this PyTorch mar. Um, but now we can actually see that I've, I've deployed this runtime called soccer runtime. We can see the model types that it takes uh, and the container it's built on, and, and that's because it's um, using the ML server interface. Now we can look at the inference service, because now we have our serving runtime ready, and we can attempt to deploy a model on it. And so if we're looking at the inference service, again, this is very similar, if not the exact same as what I showed before. It's a, a model that I've called soccer results predictor. Uh, 
uh, we have the model format here explicit and, and the runtime explicit uh, to tell model mesh to, to, to only deploy this, this, um, this inference service on this runtime and this is the format of, of the model and it'll look for the runtime that, that supports that, that format. So I'm, I'll create this resource as well. And now when we actually get our inference services, the first thing we see is, okay, we have this, this inference service now, it's called soccer results predictor, but it's not yet ready. And so if we describe it, we can see that uh, we have a status of, of you know, it's, it's not yet ready and we have a, a message here. And this message is you know, used for debugging purposes, but in this case it's like waiting for the runtime pod to become available. And this is expected because, as I said before, uh, even though we've created a serving runtime, it doesn't yet spin up pods uh, to, to deploy models onto. It only spins up pods once we've deployed an inference service that requires them. And so that's what's going on now. And so if I look at my pods, now we can actually see two, uh, two soccer runtime related pods. And the reason it's two is because model mesh defaults to deploying two per serving runtime. Uh, and now they're running. And so actually if we look at our inference services now, we can see that the inference service is ready. We can also see an endpoint given to the inference service here. And one more time, if we, if we describe the, the inference service, uh, now we see different, different information. For example, that the, mo the active model state is loaded and ready to go. So now we will simply port forward the endpoint and, and it should be listening and ready for requests. And in this other tab, um, I can look at this script that I pre-made, which is just a, a Python script, which is essentially taking um, you know, the model that I've, I've, I've created. So again, I named that model a, a soccer results predictor, and so here I'm saying I wanna use this, this model, and here are my inputs. Again, that, that model that I've created is a trivial one, which is simply inputting or parsing a JSON and, and spitting out some information. And here's that, that JSON that I want to be parsed. And the name is, we have something called name, World Cup winner, and we have a message, who will win the World Cup? Um, and then we're creating this inference request and, and we're sending it um, and we're making the inference here. And so if we run this, We can see our, our result here. Uh, the first thing is the output. Um, this is just metadata about the, about the, um, the, the input and the response. Um, and then we actually see the contents, which is the most important. And first of all, we see echo request, which is, again, my model, very trivial, simply reads what the data coming in was. And it says here, okay, name was World Cup winner, message is who will win the World Cup. We know that's correct. And then there's a server response. Again, I made this demo before last night, but the server response is that, that, that Japan would win the World Cup. So clearly this model needs you know, retraining or it's, or it's biased in some way, but, um, but, but yeah. That's, so this is, hopefully shows you a bit about um, an end-to-end -end kind of, you know, I've taken this, this model that I wanted. It's a custom model, simply a JSON parser. Um, my, my model mesh didn't have a serving runtime that I could deploy that model on. And so I went and I created this custom runtime for soccer models. Um, and then I, of course, created the inference service for my model, deployed it, and now it's ready um, and, and ready to make inferences on. Uh, so included in the slides are actually some, some of the, the, the commands that I also ran. But um, here, I'm nearing the end of this presentation, but, but I have some links. Um, that point to, for example, the repositories for the, for the projects I've talked about. There's also a repository for, for monitoring and performance testing if you're interested in, in some of the numbers of, of how, how model mesh actually scales when it's under um, you know, load for, for hundreds of thousands of models and so on. Um, there is also a, if you're interested in, in communicating with us, um, you know, feel free to join the Kubeflow Slack, and, and we have a channel called KServe, which is also uh, for, for model mesh related questions as well. And then, of course, my contact information, and, and on the bottom is a colleague who couldn't be here today, but, um, but you know, either of us are open to questions. Um, 
And, and yeah, hopefully you learned a bit about model mesh and KServe. And uh, I'll take any questions if there are any. But that's the end of my presentation. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, everyone.